Welcome to Hearing Health Today. I'm your host, Craig Sharp. In this episode, we'll focus on awareness through the eyes of the patient and get two different perspectives, one from a consumer advocacy organization and another from a person with hearing loss. We'll hear from Barbara Kelly, the executive director of the Hearing Loss Association of America, and from Abigail Herringer, who many people might recognize from her appearances on The Bachelor and The Bachelor in Paradise. This is a podcast for hearing health professionals. If you are a person with hearing loss or a member of the general public, please seek advice from your health professional about treatments for hearing loss. We'd love to hear your feedback on the podcast. Click the link in the description to share your thoughts. Abigail, Barbara, thank you so much for joining us on Hearing Health today. It's a real pleasure to have two different guests on the podcast at the same time. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Craig. It really is a pleasure and honor to be here with you and Abigail. Barbara, I have the first question to you. You're the executive director of the Hearing Loss Association of America. Could you tell us a little bit about your organization and what inspired you to work in hearing health? Oh, I sure can, Craig. Um, The Hearing Loss Association of America is a consumer organization. It's uh, made up of people with hearing loss, and it's usually people who want to stay in the hearing world with technology, whether that's hearing aids, cochlear implants, hearing assistive technology. And um, I got involved over 30 years ago because my aunt was a member of the organization and she wore hearing aids and eventually a cochlear implant. And this was years before uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and I had just moved to the D.C. area, which is where she lived, and she asked me to go to an HLAA chapter meeting with her. Mm. And I went with her, and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw a community of supportive people, people sharing their tips about technologies. I saw my aunt being able to uh, enjoy the meeting with captioning, with a hearing loop, And it kind of took off from there. So I began working for the organization and now I'm executive director. Fantastic. And then maybe to pivot over to you, Abigail. So many people might recognize your name from your appearances on The Bachelor and The Bachelor in Paradise. What has your hearing loss journey been like and what inspired you to share your story in such a public way on national television? Yeah, so it was really public. So I was born profoundly deaf, so I have no hearing if I remove my cochlear implant. Um, and I use a cochlear implant. And part of the reason I wanted to go so public with it mm-hmm. on The Bachelor and Bachelor in Paradise is just growing up, I never really saw a lot of people on mm-hmm. television or media that had cochlear implants. It was either fully hearing people or people that use sign language or had hearing aids. So that's kind of why I wanted to go public, just to show mm-hmm. people that you know, we are a very large community. We're just not shown very often. Um, So that's part of the reason why I wanted to do that. And what's the reaction been? It was pretty incredible. I was really surprised at how many people responded with similar stories or saying, I have a similar situation or I know somebody that has a situation like that. Just because, like I said earlier, I just have never really been exposed to a lot of people with cochlear implants. My sister and I, we have the same situation, but Mm -hmm. we were put into mainstream schooling. So we just never were surrounded by a lot of people with cochlear implants. Mm -hmm. And so just to see the public reaction be so large and so positive. It was really cool just to see that reaction. Yeah. And Barbara, so you mentioned HLAA is an organization that's consumer driven. What do you and your organization do to try and uh, raise the profile of that and raise awareness among sort of consumers in the general public about hearing loss and what treatments exist? Craig, that's a great question. And first, I want to say, Abigail, I think what you have done is terrific because you know, worldwide, one in five people have a hearing loss. When I ask somebody, do you know somebody with a hearing loss? They think of it and they do. Everybody knows somebody with a hearing loss. And when you see somebody like Abigail become so public and so open about talking about it, and she's so beautiful. We're sitting here on a video looking at her. (laughs) And, you know, to just say to people, look, I have a hearing loss and it doesn't stop me from doing things. And this is a a really cool technology. And that's what our organization tries to do. First of all, uh, Abigail talked about not knowing anybody else with a hearing loss. Mm -hmm. Um, We have a walk for hearing in 20 cities across the country. And this is where we see children come out 
with cochlear implants, with hearing aids. And I've seen kids for the first time meet another kid who has a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. And it's just such a community feel and it makes the, the kids feel good and the parents get to share information and resources. And so that's one of the ways that we try mm -hmm. to raise the awareness of hearing health mm -hmm. and how much hearing health means to overall health and that you really need to pay attention to it. So I just wanna thank Abigail for doing what she's done. I think she's just charming and she delivers <laughs> her message so beautifully. Well, thank you, that's really sweet. <laughs> and yeah, Abigail, did you have any reservations before going public on such a national stage? Yeah, I had a lot of reservations um, just because normally I'm a pretty private person and I've actually mm -hmm. never really openly talked about my hearing loss growing mm -hmm. up just because I've never had to be in a position where I had to do that. You know, my sister was older and so she always kind of led those conversations. My mom led those conversations. And so when I was deciding if I wanted to go on the show, I had a lot of reservations. Are people mm -hmm. going to be interested in my story? Is this something people want to hear? And then my mom said something like, well, if you go and share your story, if it can just impact one person, I think it's worth it. So that's when I decided to move forward and basically just rip the bandaid off and bring it up to the very first conversation that I had on TV. So very nerve wracking, but very happy that I did it. After that initial public disclosure of, of your hearing loss and, and sort of how it's affected you or not affected you um, in your daily life, do you find that it changes the way that you interact with the general public as you continue to make really public appearances on Bachelor in Paradise or on other platforms? Yeah, I think it's been really helpful. Um, I think it kind of just adds a new sense of confidence just because I feel like growing up, it's always kind of been an elephant in the room just because I do miss a lot in a conversation. And if somebody doesn't know that I have a hearing loss, I think it can kind of create some awkwardness of, okay, well, she didn't hear something that I said. Is she being rude or is she mm -hmm. um, just not responding. So I think just being more public with it and just addressing it right away um, has just kind of been a huge weight off my shoulders of just, okay, people understand they're more willing to help or repeat things for me. It's been really nice. And I think moving forward, I hope people can see that, you know, just having those conversations and just kind of putting it all on the table and saying, you know, this is what I need, or this is my situation. People are really nice and willing to help. Um, I think it's just getting over that initial barrier of that fear of just telling people initially. Barbara, Abigail just shared the impact of awareness on her journey and representation. And given that uh, cochlear implant recipient voices are so crucial to expanding access to cochlear implants and just awareness, I guess, around that treatment option as well. Could you tell us a little bit more about the cochlear implant international community of action? I'd be happy to talk about that. And I think, you know, Abigail hits a really important point is that people have to be willing to speak up and say yeah. what they need, because what if you're in the workplace, mm. you know, you have to be able to say, I need this accommodation to, you know, yeah. be my best at my job. So I really applaud you get, getting over that hurdle. The Cochlear Implant International Community of Action, of which HLAA is part of the steering committee, is a really, I think it's an exciting new group. It's really people advocates across the world, uh, individuals or organizations, all coming together with this collective consciousness that we wanna raise the level of awareness of cochlear implants. I mean, we know here in the US that only 5% of people who could benefit from a cochlear implant get them. From the first time people find out they have a hearing loss, it takes them five to seven years before they even do anything about it. So we have to raise that awareness and the, uh, we call it KICA. And it's just the international community coming together for this collective consciousness saying, you know, we all have our differences in the countries of some countries, cochlear implants are covered by insurance, some places they aren't. But the overall theme is that we know that cochlear implants are effective, they work. We know they're cost effective. And we know that not enough people know about them or get them. So that's kind of our common goal to advocate. 
Barbara, I wanted to ask you about the Consumer and Professional Advocacy Committee. Could you tell us a little bit about what that committee was and what the output of that committee was? Sure. This was um, part of the medical community coming together to set standards of care for cochlear implantation. And the committee that I was part of was the Consumer Mm -hmm. Advocacy Committee was to bring the consumer voice to that. The outcome of that was a consensus paper for standards of care for cochlear implantation. What we hope will continue, my personal hope, is work like that will continue because getting a cochlear implant just isn't about putting the device in and then that's it. Mm -hmm. It's a lifelong journey of hearing health with that cochlear implant. So I would like to see standards of aftercare and long-term care. And I'm hoping that there can be a continuation looking at that. And do you think with this initial tranche of work that's been done, and then hopefully with the future work that will be done around aftercare and other areas, uh, do you think that will increase awareness or increase the ability of different healthcare providers to pinpoint when a patient might need a certain type of intervention? Well, I think it will all help. Um, For example, that uh, standards of care was published in the journal of um, otolaryngology in Mm -hmm. JAMA, otolaryngology. So that's going to create awareness right there with otolaryngologists. But I think the more work like this that can be done and the more published these works are and the more people are talking about it, it's bound to move the needle on awareness, but we really have a lot of work to do. And born out of that process with the consensus paper was KICA, this global organization. And I said HLAA was very pleased to be part of the steering group to get that off the ground. And I'm really excited about KICA. Abigail, I'm curious sort of on your personal journey, you touched on it a little bit earlier, but Do you know if there was any hesitation from your parents about going for a cochlear implant for you and your sister when faced with that option? Yeah. So no one in my family had any form of parent loss. Um, So it was a very new thing for my mom to have to go through. And just she didn't really know where to start just because our hearing loss was past a certain point that we were not going to benefit from hearing aids. So then she started hearing about cochlear implants and she kind of had to decide, are we going to go the sign language route or kind of take a risk with cochlear implants, something that she had just learned about for the very first time when my sister and I were diagnosed. So I think there wasn't necessarily any reservation. It was just more, you know, she just had to do a lot of education, a lot of um, kind of tapping into different resources, a lot of um, appointments with our audiologist. And it's like what Barbara said, you know, it's just that lack of awareness. She just didn't realize all the benefits that a cochlear implant would be able to do for us. And so she had to start all that research um, when my sister and I were diagnosed. So I just don't know with other people when they are diagnosed, are they fully aware of all the benefits that a cochlear implant can do for them just because it's just not as well known as hearing aids. Yeah. Barbara, why is that? I've always been shocked by this. Why isn't it more well known? How do we increase awareness even among healthcare providers? Yeah, exactly, Craig. There's some basic things missing here uh, with primary healthcare providers. I know every year I have a physical and I'm over 50. And my doctor looks in my ears and he never once asks me how I'm hearing. Hearing health is not on the radar. And I know that uh, people who are older, if they've kind of aged into a hearing loss or it's progressing, they go to their doctor. The doctor will often say, oh, it's a normal part of aging, learn to live with it. So Mm -hmm. right there, the person is getting shut down saying, there's nothing you can do. I think that a lot of primary care physicians, even otolaryngologists and audiologists don't even know about cochlear implants or the benefits of cochlear implants. We have to do a a lot more education. I mean, if you come to the HLA website, you'll find information about cochlear Mm -hmm. implants. But I would think people like Abigail's mother really had to do a lot of searching and digging to find out about cochlear implants, to find other people who had cochlear implants to talk to. Hearing health overall needs to be more important uh, and stressed as a part of overall health, 
they check everything else about us, right? Our blood pressure, our weight, our cholesterol. And there's no such thing, Craig, as a mm -hmm. small hearing loss. Yeah. Because even a small hearing loss is going to disrupt human connections. We get things through sound. That's how we build our relationships. Abigail, I noticed you have quite a few followers on Instagram. <laughs> so I'm sure you get a bunch of uh, direct messages. And I imagine some of those must have come from people who have hearing loss themselves. What questions are you getting um, from the hearing loss community? Uh, and then how do you respond to those? I would say it's pretty split. So I think majority of my questions are young parents who had just had kids with hearing loss and just have no idea where to start. They're scared, they're confused, just don't really know what their child's future is going to look like. And then I think the other half are just a lot of people my age. You know, how do you do everyday activities with a hearing loss? What do you do in social settings? Do you go to concerts? There's a lot of things that doctors can't help them with. So it's pretty split down the middle with both of them. I think it's just that sense of community that I think they're really looking for. That was what I was looking for, for a couple of years. And I think it's just as simple as just seeing somebody else with a similar situation as yours. I think that just provides a lot of comfort and just knowing that you're not going through it alone. Abigail, since you've been more public about your hearing loss, and I think certainly when you're in production settings, like for The Bachelor or The Bachelor in Paradise, do you find yourself being more vocal about setups or accommodations that you might need, maybe more so than you might have been in the past? Oh yeah, definitely. I just remember like going through school. I absolutely hated telling my teachers and whatnot, asking for help. And my mom would always have to step in and say, okay, she's missing this. We need to put like an FM system in here. We need to move her up here. So she was always a big advocate for me because I always hated asking for help. And then when it came to doing the Bachelor in Paradise filming, it actually was easier just to ask for help just because they all knew about my situation. Yeah, um, yeah. So me just having to be vocal and saying, oh, I can't do this part of the date. I remember on the Bachelor, there was a date where we had to go paddling in the water, like yeah, okay. these giant pumpkins. And I just had to say, either I can't do this or I'm going to have to take my cochlear implant off because, you know, in case I fall and they're not waterproof. Um, so it's much easier to advocate and be able to advocate for yourself when other people are aware of your situation. But no, I, it's, it was not always easy for me. Yeah, I, you have a pretty crazy workplace. Abby. It's not like you're <laughs> necessarily sitting in an office. You're like paddling. I don't know. I feel like you're yeah. like skydiving. Involved Very in unique situations for sure. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of times people have to vocally ask for accommodation, have to sort of um, self-advocate. How do we make that easier? What does that look like where it doesn't require sort of as much courage, I guess, or putting yourself out on a limb or exposing yourself to be able to get what you need to fully participate? It takes a lot of confidence to be a self-advocate. Mm -hmm. And like Abigail talked about when she was a child, it was, you know, it was easier to let your mom do that. But once these children graduate from high school and they go to college and you don't have their parents anymore, they have to become advocates on their own. And some of them, you know, aren't prepared to do that. I think with hearing loss, because it often is the invisible disability and mm -hmm. some people can hide it. Um, it's not like a, a physical disability. If somebody's walking, using a wheelchair, it's not as obvious or if somebody's blind. So, I think you have to get out and just tell people mm -hmm. you have a hearing loss. And then there's the misconception that if they see a hearing aid or a cochlear implant, oh, you can hear fine, right? Your hearing has been corrected. Well, we all know that uh, hearing aids and cochlear implants don't correct hearing the way a pair of glasses might correct your vision. Uh, you need some added accommodations, even if it's just like, please face me when you speak to me. Um, mm -hmm. speak slower, don't yell, uh, let me see your lips. We all know the problems that people have had with face masks during the mm -hmm. pandemic, which has been terrible. So I think it's still upon the person with hearing loss who has to say, I have a hearing loss and I need this. And unfortunately, because hearing loss is so different for everyone, everybody needs something different. Mm -hmm. We know many cases of people who go in the hospital and they say, you know, I'm hard of hearing or I have a hearing loss. And they say, oh, we'll get you a sign language interpreter. Well, that, that, that won't work for me because I never learned sign language, but I might need a speech to text app, or I might need you to lower your mask, 
or I might need uh, captioning or assistive listening system. So I think with hearing loss, it, it's not like a curb cut on the yeah. sidewalk where you know everything's accommodated, right? Yeah. It, it's really nuanced. And Abigail, what? So there is a lot of technology that has come out recently. You know, apps that pair with the cochlear implant, as well as text-to-speech apps, or vice versa. What do you use? Do you use any of those technology tools to sort of help you navigate situations that might be difficult? Yeah, definitely captioning. I need captioning pretty much on any television programs. I've been trying to use more text-to-speech apps, especially with masks. I feel like that's kind of been my best solution. It's not 100% foolproof, but that's kind of what I've been trying to rely on just when it's just loud, especially in the city, going to restaurants and stuff, trying to yeah. rely on that. But just to kind of add on what Barbara was saying, she kind of hit the nail on the head of, you know, just with an invisible disability, I think just one of the hardest things is it's mm. kind of twofold asking for help, but then also kind of having to convince people too that you need that help because I think a lot of people just kind of dismiss. Yeah, right. They see me talking, they see me having conversations, and so they think she's fine. You know, she doesn't need any help. And so when I say, oh, I can't hear that or I need this accommodation, there's a lot of kind of doubt um, with that, um, which is really frustrating, you know, just because it is still a disability at the end of the day. And so I think it's just a lot of having to prove in a sense that it's still a disability um, and I still need help in these ways. And how did you find the tools that worked best for you? Was it sort of trial and error? Did you use Facebook groups? Was it talking to other people, talking to your healthcare provider? Like what avenues helped you really understand which tools would work best for you? Um, so for me, it's actually been really cool kind of going through the show because growing up, I really only heard small things here and there of, okay, well, my sister kind of heard something um, or saw something on Instagram that might be able to help us and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then now kind of opening you know, the door of the conversation around hearing loss. I have a lot of people messaging me being saying, oh, I use this app or I do this or mm -hmm. um, this has this feature. Like one of them that I wish I knew in college was Google Docs has like a transcribing service. So mm -hmm. that would have been so nice to know. Like when I was in lectures, I kind of have like an automated note-taking service. Um, so it's just something I didn't know, but people were just reaching out and letting me know about all these different things, um, which has been really incredible. I just wish I knew about them earlier. Yeah, yeah. So Barbara, what role do you think healthcare professionals, whether it's an audiologist or primary care provider, or a speech language pathologist, like what role do you think they play in helping people with hearing loss find the right resources, find the right things that are, are going to help them? Because like you mentioned, it isn't a one size fits all thing. So it is a complicated landscape. And, and how could healthcare providers assist in that journey? You know, really good healthcare providers and audiologists are really the ones that are very focused on person-centered care. They get to know the individual. What's their profession? What are their listening needs? But we've had many people uh, tell me, why couldn't I find HLAA before now? Why didn't my audiologist tell me about the Hearing Loss Association of America. So I could be part of a community. I could go to a convention. I could go to workshops. I could see the webinars. And hearing healthcare professionals, many of them do see the value of, you know, a support network or a network where we believe give people all the information we can about hearing health and hearing mm -hmm. loss and you make your own decisions and we really support people making their own decisions whether they want to get a cochlear implant or a hearing aid or use sign language whatever they want to do so i think they can start referring people to hla and letting them know that there's a community out there abigail i'm interested in your sister um your older sister what ages were you diagnosed with hearing loss she was diagnosed I want to say maybe around a year um, is when she was diagnosed, but two and a half was the youngest that she could get the surgery for the cochlear implant. Um, and then when I was born, I think my mom was able to kind of pick up quicker, you know, just like not being able to tell like where sound was coming from or just not responding. And just she was like, well, she probably has the same situation that my sister Rachel has. So both of us got the surgery when we were two and a half years old, but they're doing them much younger. Oh, they are. They're doing them much younger now, which is terrific. Oh yeah, the younger, the better. Um, just because it's such a cr crucial time um, when you're that age. Right, for language development. Mm -hmm. Was it an easier decision um, 
around what the right intervention was for you, Abigail, after your sister went through sort of a similar situation? Yeah, I think she definitely had comfort knowing that there's going to be two of us kind of going through the journey together that we'd be able to lean on each other. Um, but no, it's a really scary situation just because I think, you know, this was back in 1995 when my sister got it. My mom just never really saw a lot of people with cochlear implants, just never really saw the long term success rate of what it would be like. But then she went to the John Tracy Clinic down in California. And so she was able to see uh, kids with cochlear implants, um, kind of teenagers maybe at that time um so that was really cool for her to be able to actually talk to the parents talk to the kids see what they were doing but i think when i came along it was like okay well no her and rachel can go through this together you're kind of lucky that you had your sister pave the way not only to be an example for you but to help your mother make those decisions and i have to tell you i picked up phone calls in our office from parents who just find out that their baby has been diagnosed with the hearing loss and the fear is so great and i remember this one mother was crying and she said will my daughter ever have a date and you know what look at abigail <laughs> yeah <laughs> many dates <laughs> they just don't go on national tv to do it but yeah so why i chose to do the bachelor and whatnot just to kind of show what you were talking about earlier it's just when the kids and the parents are going for their appointments a lot of technical questions but there's just kind of a lack of okay well here's the communities available um here are things you can talk about kind of social settings dating what is it like to date with a cochlear implant so that's part of the reason I wanted to do it, just because, yeah, I just never saw anybody that had a cochlear implant try to date or try to have those conversations. Well, Abigail, that, that does actually go to a question I wanted to ask you. So if you were to um, give advice to a parent uh, who's making a similar decision like your mom made for um, you and your sister, what advice would you get about how your life has been affected by your decision to get a cochlear implant? I think um, just kind of based on what my mom has told me and just because I don't remember, you know, when I was that young and whatnot, but I think just really leaning into your support system, um, you know, really tapping into the resources that are available. She traveled down to the John Tracy Clinic just to talk to professionals, to see families, to talk to the kids. And I think just really tapping into all those resources is probably one of the biggest things you can do. And then the other thing that was really always really important was just having a lot of patience. It can be really frustrating at times. There's a lot of um, setbacks and frustrations and whatnot. And so probably the biggest advice I would tell parents is just tap into all the different resources that are available and then just have a lot of patience. And maybe, you know, if there's a, a teenage girl that's listening um, who has hearing loss, has a cochlear implant, and is maybe thinking, man, how do I live a life like Abigail? Like, I'm worried that I'm not, you know, going to go <laughs> on dates. What advice would you have for them? I always try to be careful and giving advice because it's always easier said than done just because <laughs> yeah. I'm 26 now and I'm just now starting to be very confident and comfortable with yeah. talking about it. Um, and it hasn't always been like that. But I think just one thing I always try to remember is the more positive you can be about it, I think people respond really well to it. You know, sometimes you have to fake it until you make it a little bit. But I think just being as open as you can about it and being positive. I think when you put that type of energy out there, you get the same kind of energy back. Um, so I think going on dates, you just bring it up, you know, maybe on the first date, but really casually and just say, yeah, you know, I do have a hearing loss. It's mm -hmm. a big part of me, but it's not all of me. Um, I think people respond really well to that. Great, that's fantastic. Barbara, a similar question for you. So um, I know at HLAA, you deal with not only consumers, but also healthcare professionals and just the hearing loss community at large. What advice would you have um, for either a parent um, who might have a newborn that's been recently diagnosed with hearing loss and they're facing that treatment decision? Um, and then separately, is that the same advice you would have for an adult who maybe has progressive hearing loss and is at the phase where they might need to do something different from a treatment perspective? Craig, I'm at a conference today and I, I had somebody walk up to me and tell me that his best friends just had a baby who was diagnosed with hearing loss. What advice do I have? Mm. I would say that those parents need to get all the information they could get really good, solid, unbiased information mm -hmm. so they can make decisions and they have to um, talk to other parents 
I think that's really key. And I think healthcare providers also have to be sure that they have all the information to give, the facts, mm -hmm. and they can point families in the directions of peer support, but people really need facts to make good decisions. Barbara, Abigail, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Hearing Health Today. It's been a fantastic conversation and I've learned so much. Thank you, Craig. It was a pleasure to meet Abigail and Craig, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. And Abigail, I have to say your um, confidence and courage and willingness to go on a public stage and, and talk about your hearing loss is really admirable. So thanks for sharing that story with us. Thank you for having me on today, Craig. And it was great to talk to you, Barbara, as well. We've received some great feedback from our listeners around the world. Please continue to share your perspectives with us so we can create the most engaging podcast for hearing health professionals. Click the link in the episode notes to share your thoughts. We'd love to hear them. Just a quick reminder, the views of the interviewees in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of Cochlear Limited or its subsidiaries. This material is intended for health professionals. If you are a consumer, please seek advice from your health professional about treatments for hearing loss. Outcomes may vary, and your health professional will advise about the factors which could affect your outcome.